Up today, we're going to be speaking with Maria Weaver, president of WMX at Warner Music Group. Welcome to Speed of Culture. Thanks so much for joining, Marina. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so Absolutely. happy to be here. Um, so it was interesting. I was going through your background, and one of the things that kind of stuck out to me is that when you were early in your journey, you wanted to be an actress. And, you know, I find a lot of people who want to be in the acting field early in their life end up either in the entertainment field or in the creative industries because not everyone ends up as an actor, but the things that you learn along that path of wanting to pursue the arts generally are things that are helpful later in life. So is that what you experience? And tell us about kind of that journey. Wow, you 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 dug way back. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that I've had it, anyone ask me that um, before. Um, yeah, I mean, acting was a, was a real passion for me when I was younger. And, and um, I really found myself in acting because my dad wanted me to be a lawyer. And so he put me in an acting class when I was about eight years old so that I would learn to project and learn how to present. Um, but then I fell in love with acting. And um, it wasn't until I was in college. I actually went to college for acting. So I went to performing arts high school and, and thought I was going to be an actress um, and then decided you know, I don't want to be in front of a camera. I don't want to be on a stage. I want to be in an entertainment, but in the background somewhere. Um, and so that is how I ended up. My first job was in TV for that very reason. Um, and so it was a very intentional decision that I pursued going into television. Um, but thank you for that question. Absolutely. <laughs> Do you remember the moment when you realized, you know what, this was my passion and, and I'm so thankful for this experience, but it's not what I want to do because we have a lot of younger listeners at our po at the Speed of Culture podcast that might want to go down a different path and they don't really know. And when did you know that? It, it was in college. Mm -hmm. I mean, in college, I was exposed to so many different classes. I took different classes. I was exposed to so many different people with different majors who were pursuing all different types of, you know, careers and passions. And that's, you know, was a real click for me that I could do something in the arts or art adjacent and not have to do what I was doing. I had already started to fall out of love of the um, process yeah. of auditioning and putting yourself out grind. there. It's a grind. Yep. And the, re the, re the constant rejection. I had already become a bit um, enamored or, or, or unenamored, I should say, with, with, with that process. And so I think once I was in college and I started to realize I could do something else, but still be in the field, um, it was really eye-opening for me. And so I do encourage young people, and I have two daughters myself, um, you know, you can you can pursue your passion, but in so many different ways. Yeah. And so don't think of it in a linear That's exactly way. Right. Like think of, look at all the areas that touch it or impact it. Um, and so there, there, yeah, it was definitely a very intentional decision and I'm, I'm thankful I'm grateful yeah. that I was able to to figure that out while I was still in college Absolutely. And, and make that pivot yeah I mean I have teenagers as well and I think the world they're growing up today is obviously so different than the world we grew up in and yes. you know they're on social media and they're yes. looking at people's successes or perceived successes and it puts undue pressure on yes. them to decide the path they want to go down at a premature stage in life yeah and you know like yourself, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but the process of learning about law, I was able to extract some of those things I still have today. So right, just because you start into something, you start learning about something, you don't end up there. It doesn't mean it's a waste of time. That's right, not yeah. at all. I mean, I think a lot of my skills that I learned when I was pursuing acting are skills that I bring with me now. You know, the ability to get on a stage and yeah. present to a large audience is something I learned at a very young age, even though technically I'm actually a fairly shy and introverted person, but I know how to turn it on when I get onto a stage. It's right. just because that that was a training though for me. And if I hadn't gone through that training, it's kind of interesting whether or not I would have been able to get over it on my own just Absolutely. in a process, right? Yeah, so. those are things that are hard to learn. Right. So not too many years uh, after leaving college, you joined HBO mm -hmm. um, in 1997. And that was really the beginning or I guess mid-stage of the peak of their ascent because HBO has been a transformational force in media and entertainment. And you were there for seven years, you know, in various different positions. Tell us about your journey at HBO from what you remember and what you what you took away from that experience. It was an amazing experience. 
I was actually at Showtime right before HBO, mm -hmm. which was very interesting because they both were pursuing original content at the same time. And I made the choice of leaving Showtime and going to HBO because it felt like HBO was going to be the leader in the space. And sure enough, I mean, we, we know the kind of content that they that they made. It was also interesting to be a part of the journey of original movies is kind of where they started. Yeah. And, and, and that's when I joined the company. It was right after, I think, the Don King movie, which was a really long time ago. And then the, the exploration around series and other types of formats. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing about being a part of HBO during that time was that it, it felt small and it felt like a family. And we were all keenly aware that we were doing something that was incredibly disruptive, incredibly innovative, and we all wanted it to be successful and to win. And so there was just this, in, this camaraderie. Um, and it was also just interesting the way the programming teams and the marketing teams worked. And I was on the marketing side and it was very collaborative, um, which... I think in a lot of organizations, you would think, oh, programming just goes and just does what they want to do. But marketing was really an integral part of the process. Um, and so that was really interesting for me as well. It's just a, a young age being a part of of that energy and that excitement. Absolutely. I think around that time period, Sopranos had just come out and that was sort of like a landmark. Yeah. Sopr I was there for Sopranos and Sex in the City and um, Oz and The Wire and, and yeah. Some of the greatest, so some of the greatest. Pieces, of pieces of content ever created, That's right. many would say. That's so. right. And we were also exploring and playing with digital. You know, we um, we, we thought we were really doing something when we created HBO.com and like tried to figure out how to give content to um, consumers over the web. And, yeah. you know, it was just- That was a, the dawn of the internet. It was the dawn of the internet. Yeah, yeah. So it was just a, an interesting time. I was there when AOL bought Time Warner. Mm -hmm. So that whole process of a, of a big mer major merger and, and what that um, can do and how that can- you know, kind of break up a system, if you will, yeah. and how that gets rebuilt. And so I, I learned a lot during my time there. Absolutely. Of... And you were there for, for seven years. And, you know, many folks who join a company like that, that's a fast growing prominent brand, stay there forever. You mm -hmm. made a decision after seven years to leave. Do you remember what kind of precipitated that decision? And then tell us about where you went next, which was uh, Interactive One. Yeah. So it, So I left there. Um, I left HBO um, after I had my second child and decided to spend time with my children. And so I pursued a personal passion of mine, which was once again linking my love of film TV with um, a passion around helping young directors and filmmakers get their films made and created a... Um, a film finance company. And so I left HBO um, and was in some ways a stay-at-home mom for five years, although I had triple threat films. But it really was a pivotal time, I think, women, especially at that moment, um, because it was the transformation of the, kind of what digital is today. Yeah. We hadn't really blown up yet. Um, we had to make a decision. You were either pursuing a career and not getting any reasonable time with your children or you were staying at home. And, and so I made the difficult decision of leaving HBO to, to be with my children. Um, and then I came back into the workforce and went to interactive one. Um, now I'm grateful that most women don't have to make such a hard decision. I mean, they can, you can actually have the balance of the two and because of work of, from home and because of work from home, yeah. because you can get emails on your phone. I exactly. mean, I couldn't get emails on my phone, right? right. I was walking around with a, a trio. I don't know if you of course, <laughs> I had a trio phones. too. I had them all, <laughs> you yeah. know, and so you couldn't really do but so much on those things. And so I literally was going to work in the morning before my youngest or it, either of my children were waking up and I was coming home after they were in bed. I right. just literally was not seeing them at all. Um, and so that's so that's actually why I left HBO. HBO is a great place. It's you're right. It's not a place you just leave. Mm -hmm. um, the godmother of my children I met there. You know, like some of my closest friends are from HBO. Um, but yeah, and when I came back, I came back and went to a company called Interactive One. Yeah. And so I mean, it's interesting when you say that because you know the choices that 
especially women had to make and, and all parents really, um, you know, when they had children and they knew that it, like it was a light switch off and on. And when it was on, you weren't home. You weren't really accessible. It was often longer commutes. And it was just it was a different world back then because the accessibility of data and communications was not what it was today. And that's right. You couldn't really be around your kids. And many people missed out on that. That's so I right. think that's something that hopefully people now, you know, that may have young children in their workforce, maybe could realize is that it's, it's an incredible opportunity if you can balance it all. A lot that's of people true. have a hard time balancing it all. It still is hard. To, I think it's actually in many ways harder to yeah, balance it, 100%. right? Because you're taking your work home with you, yeah. right? So, you know, it, it's, it's hard to say which is better, truthfully, right? Because when I was home, I was home. Right. And, I, and, and no one right. could call no one could me. No reach you, right. And no one wasn't asking me to, you know, check that email or, or read this contract or anything like that. So at least when I was home, I could be hyper-focused. Um, it's a great and point. And now, right, you take you, you take your laptop home. You're at the Little League game. You're getting a text from your client, and you're, you, you oh, know, yeah. the, right. It, and people will say, "Oh, you know, I need to go home and and have dinner with my kids." They're like, "Oh, yeah, 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 you'll get back on later, right?" There's an expectation that that's the balance, right? Oh, okay, sure, yeah, you can go home now, but like at some point in time, you're going to respond to that email, right? Like, and so people then start working again at eleven o'clock at night, and it happens in a lot of households, and so that's not necessarily a hundred percent better totally i mean covid was the <laughs> penultimate example of that where you had people bouncing their babies on their knees while they're on yeah. zoom calls yeah. trying to figure it all out so yeah. it like completely blended those lines and Blurred i actually think lines. it was yeah. so beautiful to see yeah it was it was also beautiful to see from the standpoint of seeing a lot of dads in those scenarios um i was at comcast when when covid happened and um there was a newly appointed GM of one of our divisions effective, and he had a very young baby. And his, mo his the mom, his wife, um, also very successful in her career. And they would they would go back and forth with the babies. And so you could be on a, the middle of a big, huge budget prep call with him, and you know he would be rocking his baby. And um, and I think the nanny had COVID or something. So, you know, it just, but that was a real, I, everyone commented on how much that humanized him yeah. for the company. And so I actually think it had a lot of positive from that standpoint totally. as well. I experienced the same thing. So so going back to your journey, so, yes. you, so you had the time off um, to be with your family and then you um, joined Interactive One where you were at um, for an equally as long stint as HBO. You were there for eight years. Yeah. Uh, tell us about Interactive One and, and what your takeaways were from that experience. So when I decided to re-enter um, the workforce, it, it would have been a natural thing for me just to go back into a television uh, network, um, having been at you know Showtime and HBO, et cetera. Um, but I really want to try and do something different and there was this opportunity of, of a startup, if you will, within an established business, a publicly held um, company, where they wanted to kind of disrupt the radio business. And I oftentimes find myself in these intrigue, intriguing opportunities of disruption. And so I joined Interactive One for that reason. Um, essentially, they gave us X amount of dollars, similar to the way we would have normally gone and raised money. And they said, you know, go start this division. I think initially the plan of the thought was that it would spin off or would they would sell it off or something of that nature. Um, but I think it's still a part of Radio One to this day because it diversifies its radio, it, its revenue streams, um, if you will. But it was, yeah, I was employee number five. I was one of the founders. Um, we didn't even have a name for any of our dot coms yet. But we started this endeavor. And right there is when, um, you know, Wall Street kind of fell apart. Yeah. Um, it was right at that pivotal time. The, and the financial crisis of The financial yep. crisis of 2008. And, um, you know, the ad market fell apart. And, and so it was a very interesting time to be at a startup trying to create this business. Um, Facebook was really just starting to blow yep. up. Twitter was just starting to really establish. I think there was Foursquare. I mean, there was all of these different um, uh, digital companies that were 
at the forefront of, of, you know, where they are today. And we were a part of that and, and trying to figure out what that meant for us and how we were going to grow our business and, and create a business around it. Um, so a really interesting and really interesting time to be at a digital company it was digital first, digitally led um, versus it being a dot com within another company. Right. Yeah. And so um, it it's a different experience when if your site goes down, you've just lost a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. You know, that had never been my experience before. If HBO.com had gone down, HBO was fine. Right. Right. And so here we were in a, in a different place. Um, and uh, so I learned a lot. I learned a lot about the digital industry during that time. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy to think of all the changes that have ha that happened from, say, the year 1999 to 2020. Um, not only in terms of culture and society, we talked about COVID, but you know, you mentioned some of these digital tools which have changed humanity forever, whether it be Twitter or Facebook or YouTube. And um, we were there as those things were being invented and trying to figure out what are we going to do about this? How's it going to impact the consumer? That's Does right. my business even matter anymore? That's right. Many companies are doing the same thing today with what's been happening with AI over the last six months. So right. being able to understand the impact of these things, quickly respond to it take a leadership position, That's I right. think is really what has separated people who have been successful in their careers and others, maybe not so much. Right. So I have to cough. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Right. <clears throat> I was just trying to let you finish that sentence. <laughs> oh, fine. You did great. Thank you for that. Um, so, and then, okay. yeah. Uh, and then a after um, a in interactive one, you, you were at Comcast, which is obviously much larger company. When you started there, I'm sure there wasn't five people <laughs> at the company. That's it's one true. of the largest communication uh, and media companies in the world. Um, and you were there for, for four years, right up until uh, 2020. Um, tell us about your experience at, at Comcast and what your takeaways were from there. Yeah, the decision to leave Interactive One um, was a, a conscious decision of, of feeling ready to um, and wanting to be at a bigger organization and yeah. have an impact at a bigger organization. And, uh, you know, there were many people who thought I should um, look at one of the platforms as a next step versus going back into more traditional television media kind of um, company. Um, I knew I wanted to go someplace where I felt like I could have a real impact. And um, the opportunity at Comcast was was just that. I mean, there's a, a, a large portion of Comcast that thinks of itself um, at the forefront of technology, and 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 it has been when you think about what um, they created with um, the voice control and the voice remote and yeah. Xfinity and how that has evolved. But on the advertising side, on the ad sales side, it was still a fairly antiquated business. It was still very much spots and dots, um, and they didn't really have a digital um, go-to-market strategy. And and so that's what they hired me to do. And and. I do think it was my background in both television, historically in television, um, as well as in the digital space where I had just been and being able to bring that together, speak the, the language and the lingo of my television colleagues while trying to transform the digital um, business is, is, is really what was attractive for them of me. And yeah. for me, it was attractive to just be a part of transforming that business. Um, and it's, you know, a fairly sizable business within Comcast. Um, and we really set out to think about the go to market in a different way. What are advertisers really looking for? How can we utilize our data in a interesting and, and differentiated way, et cetera. And, uh, it was, it was a fun, it was a fun time. Yeah. And now uh, you know, in 2020, you joined where you're still today. Um, as president of WMX um, at Warner Music Group, you know it sounds like such a cool job. When I, when I was looking at what WMX does and the artists that Warner serves, um, you know, why did you take the role? And and just tell us about the company and, and what you're working on. Well, at at Comcast, I was a uh, chief marketing officer of the division mm -hmm. of um, Comcast Advertising, and I wanted my next role to be much more of a general manager kind of opportunity and role. Um, and that opportunity may have come at, at Comcast. I definitely enjoy all of the people. And Comcast has, a, has some of the nicest people I have ever worked with. 
Um, but this just came about. Um, someone recommended me for the role. And when I first met with um when I first met with Warner, my first interact my first inclination was I don't come from music, so I'm not really sure that I would be the right person. Right. But what they were really looking for was not someone that came from music, but was for someone who understood other commercial opportunities that could enhance the work that they're doing in music. Go to market for their artists, if you will. That's right. right. And expand the revenue opportunities outside of music. So whether it be merch and touring and you know other types of revenue streams, media, advertising, et cetera. And that was really intriguing to me. Um, Warner did not put its inventory in vivo the way Universal and Sony did. So Warner had an entire media opportunity that hadn't really been fully exploited. So they were sitting on all of these different um, revenue streams. Assets, and monetizable assets. assets, assets that's right. right. O and O platforms that they had bought. They had bought Uproxx and Hip Hop DX, but they were sitting there. They were, it, for me, it felt like they were sitting on a gold mine and it just needed, um, it needed a story and it needed a, a transformation of of just structure in, in many ways because the bones were there. Um, right, those decisions had already been made before I got there. They just had all these assets that they had they hadn't fully um, figured out how to monetize. Gotcha, and that was really intriguing to me. So that's why I joined. So you have these monetizable assets, and then you have the artists, and then you have I suppose brands or the consumer markets that want to take advantage of these assets. Um, and then you, it's up to you to put them all together. That's correct. So what does that process look like? Like, where's the artist fit into all of this? Well, it's really interesting. I think historically it was, it was all very siloed, if right. you will. And so this was the opportunity is how do we create packaging opportunities for brands that are more valuable than they could get anywhere else, right? Because we do have the access to the artist. We're putting on their tours and helping them with their touring. We're doing these pop-up experiences, which is another fan touch point, yeah. if you will, for a brand. And then we have these O&O &O and media assets. And recently we launched our Fast Channels, right? So the opportunity to bring all of that together is really at the core of, of what, we're, what we're figuring out and working on together with brands. I wouldn't say... It's all 100% all the time happening that way. Mm -hmm. I think we still um, operate a lot of our media assets it, transactionally in one place and a lot of our kind of um, like branded experiences like in another place, et cetera. And so a big priority for us in 23 has been bringing these together even more and offering them and packaging them up. Gotcha. For, uh, so can you give us an example, I guess, of something that, you can talk about in terms of how a brand has worked with WMX to activate yeah. across your inv inventory. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, we have, you know, we, we have a lot of, as I said, transactional opportunities, which are really just leveraging a lot of our YouTube inventory and then our O and O. But I do think our secret sauce is around our branded experiences that we create and the unique um, opportunities to work with, whether it be our artists or, um, emerging artists that we help a brand, to, you know, identify, et cetera. Um, we recently did a program with um, Coca-Cola, um, which has been really interesting at looking at emerging artists, but being able to bring them to the forefront in, in an experience or in platforms that they normally wouldn't have been in. And you know, we also then partnered them up with an A&R person from Warner Records to coach them on what it means to be in the music business. And so really trying to bring like the business side together with the artistic side and the creative side has really been interesting. And then that can run not only on Uproxx, which is one of our um, flag flagship ship dot coms, but also on our fast channels. Gotcha. So ultimately, these brands need content. And they want to play into consumer passion points. So if you're a big brand and you want to enter into the music sphere, it's how do you do it? And you come to WMX and you have this wide variety of of assets and artists and you can kind of connect the dots and come to them with a custom package or program that allows them to essentially activate within the music world. You said it 100% right. I mean, I think most brands are trying to figure out how do they either... Um, impact culture 
or drive culture. Um, and oftentimes they're trying to figure out how do they do that and leverage music or musical artists. And so being at the forefront of that and being able to bring that to them is, is it's a no brainer and it feels very natural. Um, and so when brands come to us, it's it feels very authentic. It's just about us figuring out the right package opportunity, if you will, the right artist to bring it to life so that it does feel authentic for them and authentic for us. Yeah, I would imagine also the the audience of the particular, you know, of the audience of the artist needs to match the audience of the brand. Correct. And that's a big part of it. That's correct. So is that data that you have that this artist, you know, attracts a certain demographic and this fits with this brand's profile and that's how we think it makes sense. One of the um, key differentiators for us is that we, in addition to the media piece, which is a big important part for us, we operate, WMX operates all of our artists, most of our artists, um, web sites and e-commerce platforms, which means we have a lot of first party data, right? Huge, we have right. over 200 artist stores that we're managing every single day out of WMX. So our first party data and our understanding of the artist super fans, what they like, who they are, where they go, et cetera, is right at our fingertips. And when we can look at that as well against the third party data and then data of our client, we really can help them say, okay, this is the right target market for us to go after. And we do try to, um, every year we're always trying to think about how do we expand our O and O's, right? So that we're, that we're reaching even more audiences authentically, but more and more audiences. So recently we launched um, a platform primarily on TikTok called Lasso Nation, which is targeting um, country music artists, right? Because our Warner Nashville is a big um, part of our business. And so we know that we need to continue to segment the audiences the same way our you know clients and our brands do. And so that we make sure that we're reaching as many people as possible. Yeah, it's interesting because the whole creator economy has been such a hot topic and such a buzzword as of late. Many people who are quote unquote creators really don't create much. These artists create art. They they create art that art that moves people. And I think it's the ultimate example of tapping into a creator is a is a musical artist. And music is something that has been proven to just eviscerate emotion in people that brands probably want to connect with. So I think the story there is really strong, especially in a world where traditional media is, is far less impactful right now. But make no mistake, every single day on every subway and every schoolyard, people are listening to music. That's right. Yeah. And that's not going away anytime soon. It's not going away anytime soon. And when you think about artists, I mean, they're, they're, um, artists are truly creative and their value is in their ability to connect with their fans through their art in a in a different way than I think kind of the average creator does, right? Yeah. Like it, it's um it's it's coming from a place that's really authentic for them. Most artists aren't thinking about, oh well my fans like this, let me go write this song. They're writing songs or they're creating music that resonates with them, right? And then they're hoping that their fans can feel it too, um, which is a very different way, right? I think oftentimes, even when you think about how a lot of brands approach things, or you think about what does a consumer want? What does the consumer need? Everything oftentimes starts with the consumer, yeah. right? When you're working with artists, it's starting with them. That's a great right? insight. And it's really about- So much more authentic in some it's ways. so much yeah, more authentic, it's right? Heart. That's exactly right. And that was, a, that was a learning for me coming from TV and film um, to coming to the music industry. It, that is a key differentiator in, in how the music industry operates and supports its musical artists versus how TV supports its TV shows. Yeah. Very, very, very different. And so, you know, when I think about brands and when I'm talking to a CMO, like think about it from the standpoint of the artist, right? It's almost like we have to think about the marketing as a marketer but let's also think about it from the artist's point of view and what's going to resonate with the artist because that's how you're going to get the most out of them. Well, and don't don't you also run into situations where you actually have to sell the artist on the brand because they have oh, artistic integrity. They're pushing things out that are close to their heart. Do they, do they really want to partner with, you know, a cookie or, or soda brand? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, no, it has to be authentic to them. And they say no um, 
uh, more often than I wish. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. Because oftentimes they're not they're not motivated necessarily just by a check. Right, that's not how they think about who they are. That's not how they think about their brand. That's not you know how they think about their go to market, if you will. And so, yeah, we pitch artists all the time on different opportunities. And I think it's really up to us at WMX to make sure we know that what we're pitching aligns with what the artist is looking for, what the artist wants, right? Because what we don't want to have to do is go back to a brand and say, no, they don't want to do it. We want to actually make sure we're working with the brands that the art we know the artists already have interest in, that they already feel aligned with. And so that it becomes a win-win and everyone's really excited about it. Um, and that's not always easy to do, but yes, it's completely the artist can do. It's not in their contract, yeah. right? Versus in TV, it's in your contract. You have to show up at the upfronts. You have to like, there are certain things you have to do. You have to do, you know, X number of press junkets, et cetera. Um, and so it's very different on that side. Yeah. I mean, what's interesting is that many prominent artists, more so in the hip hop space, have made most of their income or wealth from actually launching their own brands. So you Correct. look at Diddy, Jay-Z, even 50 Cent with his vitamin water deal, the list go on and on and on. Uh, do the artists you work with, are they also interested in equity opportunities with with these brands or getting involved in startups versus just renting their name and likeness to larger, more established entities, just given what some of the larger players in the space have been able to accomplish? Wow, that's a really, really great question. I think there are some artists who think that way. I think more managers think that way than artists. Yeah. And we at WMX are really um, bullish on that um, because I I think it's not only an opportunity for the artist long term, yeah. right? Like it's going to be sustain potentially sustainable wealth for them, right? Even if their music career doesn't take off. I mean, when was the last time 50 Cent? made a song. I'm, right. not, I'm not even sure, but I know his last three TV shows, right? And I, you know, I know his vitamin water and I know some of the other things. So it's thinking about like your longevity, right? What's your career going to turn into? And I don't necessarily know that artists are trained to think that way. Yeah. The way the way athletes are, right? Like one of the first conversations an athlete has with their agent after they sign their contract is like, if you're if you break your leg or you know if something happens and you can no longer play basketball or, like what are we going to do and they start mapping that out that's not the conversation that happens with artists and so it's a real miss i think for a lot of artists because there's there's lots of opportunity so i like to think of when i'm speaking with brands is rather than it being just a one off transactional thing what can we do with the artists that is more long-term. And whether that be creating products together or whether that be getting equity in something, um, it's, it's I think, the future, and for sure, it's high on WMX's list of how we should really be working with our artists and and helping them grow. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know if you saw the movie Air about Michael Jordan, and but I haven't seen you, it you yet. To, or, I, think, I know. Yeah, it's, it's out high now. So, I um, know. but you know that the the famous deal he made, um, driven by his mother with yes. Nike, where yeah. they're like, we just don't want a check. We want a piece of every sneaker that's going to be sold, and that's it's right. it's made Michael Jordan a billionaire. That's and right. I think while not every deal will make your artists billionaires, it really does create an annuity for them. And, right. and, and I, if I were launching a startup in food and beverage or CPG, et cetera, and I want to create a partner, my partner would be an artist or a celebrity because they have built in distribution, yes. you know, and they have a, they have a fan base that creates sort of like the catalyst to create brand love. Yes. And it's a huge differentiator, yeah. you know, like what's really the difference between this bottle of water or the other, That's really right. nothing, but the artist actually gives it a taste and flavor, no pun intended. That's right. That that is differentiating. That's right. That's right. And we do have examples of where we've done that. I mean, we're like I said, we're we're at the start yeah. of where we think that can be, and we definitely see it as a big part of our transformation of of how do we create even more intentional long term relationships with our artists. Um, but recently, um, Ed Sheeran launched um, Tingly Ted's, which is a hot sauce. Um, that we um, that we launched with very him, cool. which is very cool, and it's authentic to him. Um, he uh, 
He loves ketchup and he loves hot sauce. And that is a known fact if you're an Ed Sheeran fan. And and so it, it works, right? Because it's, it's authentic. Some, it's authentic. It's yeah. something that means a lot to him. And he was highly engaged through the whole process. Um, and so none of it was done for him on his behalf where it just slapped his, you know, slap his name on it. His name is actually, I don't even think is on there, thinking of the logo. Um and so it's really authentic to who he is. And, and so I think there, w- there are more and more of those types of opportunities that we can bring forward. Absolutely. So shifting gears a little bit as we wrap up here, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your, the pie chart of your day? Because I just, as, as I'm hearing you talk about all these different things you're working on, I can't imagine what a normal day looks like if there even is a normal day for you. But like, how do you spend time planning out your week and how you allocate your time so you can make sure you're moving the business forward? That's a really interesting question. Um, my 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 role at Warner is unique in that I do feel like I work in several different industries at one time. So right. of course it's the music industry, but the media industry is its own se- advertising is its own separate industry, right? With its own lingo and 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 how things are measured is very different than in the music industry. Um, we operate in the retail space, so that's its own separate um, e-commerce, etc. And so it's really important for me that I focus on the key areas of the business that I think are going to have the most. Um, uh, opportunity of growth and not try to focus on everything all at once. And that, right this very moment, on the media side, we are really focused on our um, fast channels and the, you know, of course, it's also available VOD, but the distribution and expanding distributors and getting more distribution and also adding some additional channels over the course of this next year. Because I think that is a really key differentiator for us. I spent a lot of time on that. Um, On the e-commerce side and in our areas where we're touching our fans, really important that we are um, meeting our fans where they are, all of these different platforms, social commerce, t-commerce, et cetera, and making sure that we're creating real value for them. So I spend a lot of time also thinking about our fans. and then I would probably say the third bucket is around the people. Um, it's a, you know, WMX is a sizable operation um, and all d- different types of people, meaning, um, you know, we have folks that are very dedicated and focused on, you know, music and the touring and they're out there literally on the tours, you know, traveling and, you know, and and, and spending a lot of time in their in their trucks, et cetera. And then we have, you know, strategists who are thinking about kind of like bigger picture businesses. And and so how do we create an environment um, where everyone feels connected yeah. and everyone feels included and diversity is really important to me. And I do spend a reasonable amount of time on thinking about the company culture and how do we ensure that during this time of, what feels like a level of instability in the marketplace, companies laying off, you read in the press, thousands of people, et cetera, it creates a level of angst. Yeah. How do I ensure that we are creating a level of stability and across, you know, a thousand people, et cetera? Um, Not easy, but I do spend a reasonable amount of time on that because we won't be successful if I don't have the right people and if the people aren't motivated to be on this journey with us. It's a. It's not an easy journey, right? Yeah. It's a. It's a. There's a lot of hard work that has to go into it, and so you have to be inspired to want to be a part of it and uh, wake up hopefully every day feeling good that you're a part of WMX. Yeah, and and not to mention, I mean, you talk about the sort of financial angst that's happening in the economy right now, but from a social standpoint, you mentioned diversity and all the issues our country has and the polarization yes. uh, that we're seeing. It's, it impacts a lot of people as well um, of of diverse backgrounds. And that's something that you also want to manage, you know, moving forward to build that diverse organization that's that's well-rounded in its worldview. That's right. And we work in an industry where, you know, free speech is encouraged, right? When you think about music, I mean, we want to work with all different types of artists and different types of people have different types of views. And um, we have to be able to be respectful about that and honor that and 
um, at the same time still feel really good about about our work. It is a it is an interesting it is an interesting time when it when it comes to that for sure. Hundred percent. So to wrap up here, Maria, and this has been an amazing interview. Just uh, experiencing your journey, you've clearly uh, made a lot of right decisions along your path, and uh, now you're you're at a really exciting position um, at WMX. When you look back on your career, going all the way back to your um, aspirations to be an actress, um, what decisions do you think you made that were most impactful to your career along the way that maybe we would want to impart on some of our younger listeners uh, here at the podcast? I think I was always fairly intentional with my decisions. I I think I could have been wooed, if you will, by, um, you know, shiny object syndrome. Right? They, for, when I was at HBO um, is when dot-coms were really the first dot-com bubble burst, right? Um, and there were a lot of people who left HBO, you know, going to a dot-com. And um, I knew that where I was was where I wanted to be. And so I think as you're going through your journey, it's always taking us moment to step back to think about, does this align with where I want to be long term? Does this get me to where I want to go? Even the time you took off, right? Even the time I took off was very intentional. And, you know, it was not easy coming back, right? It was not easy because companies don't really have uh, an acceptance of someone who steps away for a number of years, yeah, there's a right? Big, there's, there's a gap a, in your CV and they're like, where were you? Yes, yeah. and why? And how do you know you want to come back? And how can you be sure? I mean, the questioning and some of the, the lines of questioning were really interesting. I know, though, that that was the right decision for me. I have no regrets in that. But when I came back, I had to be really intentional about how I wanted to handle that. When I came back, people were you know, I always tease that I left. Um, I left during the Stone Age, and I came back in this, you know, in this technology age, and it was um, really interesting. You know, I was getting text messages at seven in the morning. I'm like, what's happening? How's you know, how are yeah. people operating in this fast-paced kind of way? Um, but yes, every every moment was very intentional, and I knew when I stepped away that there would be a time I'd come back. Like it was never, I'm I'm stepping away, and this is you know, I'm gonna you know be a stay-at-home mom forever. That was never that was never the plan. Um, the plan was I want to step away until my youngest is in kindergarten, and then I want to go back. And I I probably oversimplified it in my head. I I think in my mind, and, and maybe that's a good thing, right? Because if you um, really stop and overanalyze, you will talk yourself out of things that seem really difficult. Because it was difficult to come back, and it did take me a minute to find the right opportunity that felt right for me where I was at that moment in my journey. And I think it's a blessing that sometimes I just take a leap of faith, even yeah. leaving Comcast and going to Warner. Um, you know, it's an industry that I didn't know. And people, so many people, I don't know. I could walk into a media room at any given day. I can walk into a room at CES and I'm going to see a whole room full of people that I've known for a really long time. And now I walk into a music you know, event, and I don't know a soul, right. right? And so it's almost like you're restarting, right? Reestablishing yourself. And so each of those moments can feel really scary if you start to really analyze them. I think I'm intentional, but I don't overanalyze it. I just, I just I trust my gut and I go for it. So with that, and finally, is there a, a mantra that you like to live by or kind of like your thing? If someone's like, well, what is your mantra? What is the thing that drives you every day? What comes to mind for you? I don't know. I I have mantras that are more about um, uh, more about being positive okay. and focusing on um, sending positivity into the world. And so I start most of my days it, with mantras, talking to myself about it's going to be a great day. Everything's going to be optimism, op optimistic, and everything's going to be um, everything's going to go the way you want it to go. And Knowing that, luckily enough, the industry we work in, um, for the most part, is bringing joy to people. And I say that to people all the time. You know, we were just talking about, you know, the impact of music for most people is a lot of joy and happiness. And so if you focus on what we're trying to do, whether you're trying to get them their, you know, a fan, their favorite T-shirt or box set, or you're trying to make sure they get their, you know, tickets for a tour, et cetera. It's bringing some real joy and happiness to them. And if you focus on that, all of the 
stuff that can get through, um, get in your day is really just stuff. And if we focus on what we're really trying to bring for the fans, it really just makes it, it makes it all worth it in in my mind. And and so I, oftentimes it's what I say in meetings. I'm like, we're bringing joy to people. Like, let's, uh, let's have joy ourselves and, and, and feel good about it. Um, but I definitely try to have positivity in my day every day. Absolutely. Well, I have no doubt you're going to continue to, uh, to spray positivity around uh, everyone you touch in your career. And I really appreciate you taking the time uh, with us today. So a special thanks to Maria Weaver, president of WMX at Warner Music Group. A special thanks for joining us today. Thanks to our Susie team for helping us pull all this together. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the Speed of Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Till next time, see you soon, everyone. Take care. Speed of Culture is brought to you by Suzy as part of the Adweek Podcast Network and ACAST Creator Network. You can listen and subscribe to all Adweek's podcasts by visiting adweek.com slash podcasts. To find out more about Suzy, head to suzy.com. And make sure to search for the Speed of Culture in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Click follow so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Suzy, thanks for listening.